Today I want to talk to you from a passage which probably some of you are quite familiar with. It's in Psalms 27. I told the staff here that I usually don't use PowerPoint. The reason being because I want you to read your own Bible. <laughs> How many of you still have your Bible with you every Sunday? Yeah, good. <laughs> I always believe that you, know, you should bring your Bible to the church by all means. All right? If you don't have one, share with someone next to you. That's what the church is for, isn't it? Right? You have your community here, share with one another. Psalms 27, if you have your Bible, just turn there and put your finger there, just keep it there. Now, this year, we know many things are changing. Yesterday night, we just have our new US president installed, Trump. Some are happy, some are not. Okay? And some people are protesting about it as well. Whatever it is, we know that things are changing. Um, and last year, a lot of things changed as well. We have Brexit, and then we have all this hoo-ha going on. And uh, the world is not at peace. Things are, seems to be not in a very good shape, right? And uh, economists tell us this year, Malaysia, we have a very challenging year. Things, the price will be going up and things like that. And it instills so much fear into the people. A lot of people that I met in the church tell me, Pastor, I'm so freaked out for this year. I don't know what to expect. You know, those in the property line tell me, Pastor, you know, this year will be a very gloomy year. Don't know, what, don't know be able to sell or not. You know, talking about selling your office, right? Property agent tell me all these things. You know, we are so fearful. And fear is a reality that we face almost every day. Whether you like it or not. You face fear every day. But of course, not, fear, not all fears are bad. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There are certain fears are good for us. Fear is to keep us from doing what is wrong, right or not? If you're not fearful of heat, you're going to touch the frying pan, you know what you're going to get. So you know that that is a good fear for you. Fear protects us in some way, true or not? Right, because that's why if you read the Old Testament, it's very scary when God releases His wrath upon His people. It's very scary. And it's meant to be scary. Some theologians try to tone down the scary part, but it's not the point. The point is, if you do something bad, you're supposed to face bad consequences. And that is supposed to be fe fearful, scary. And it's good for you in some sense. However, there are certain fear that we face in life that are not so good for us. Those fear restrict us from fulfilling our life journey. Those fears restrict us from doing what we're supposed to be doing. Those fears stop us from evangelizing, stop us from moving forward, stop us from fulfilling what God has installed for us. And so this morning, I want to tell you a good news. That in Psalms 27, the psalmist teaches us how do we face such fears? That when we are facing the troubles in life, the difficulties that we cannot solve, the uncertainties, you know, those sleepless nights that you are facing, those kind of fear, how do you face them? How do you tackle them? How do you overcome them? And so in Psalms 27, this is a beautiful psalm and teaches us how we can overcome those fear. And let me just go to you and I read to you from NIV version, New International Version, Psalms 27. You ready? Okay. Right. Psalms 27 of David, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Verse 5, 
for in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent i will sacrifice with shouts of joy i will sing and make music to the lord verse 7 hear my voice when i call lord be merciful to me and answer me my heart says to you seek his face your face lord i will seek do not hide your face from me do not turn your servant away in anger you have been my helper do not reject me or forsake me god my savior Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressor. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. Verse 13. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, at this point, I ask your spirit to dwell in us and to speak this word into our hearts. And let this word transform us as we are open to you, Lord, as we are, getting, we are ready to hear your word, let your word take root in our heart now, Lord. Bless this word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, in this, word, in this psalm, Psalms 27, it's a psalm that is known to be, rec- to be written by David. Probably David was in a very dangerous situation. You know, maybe he was being hunted down. We don't know exactly what was the situation, but he was in a very dangerous situation, very scary. Fear creeps into his heart. And this was the psalm that he wrote. Um, and of course, many psalmists wrote similar kind of psalms if you read psalms in total. But in these psalms, there are three things we can learn. How should one of us, if we face fear in life, how do we deal with our, our fear? Three things. How many things? Three things, very simple, three things. Yeah. I think most of the sermon have three points. <laughs> it's easier to remember. Three things. Okay. The first thing that we can learn here is that whenever you face a situation, whenever you face a problem or fear that creeps into your life, instead of focusing on that fear itself, of the trouble itself, you focus on God. Focus on God. The first thing you should do is to recognize God. Recognize God's attribute. Let me ask you a simple question. Do you know God? Do you know God? Many of us will say, yes, of course I know God. I come to church every Sunday. What do you mean I don't know God? But how much do you know about God? What are the names of God do you know of? What are the different attributes, the characteristic of God that you know of? Now, why I ask this question? Because in those moments when your life is going through difficulties, the, the natural tendency for us is to focus on the problem itself. True or not? When you're going through some problem, you can't sleep. Why? Because every night when you want to sleep, your mind automatically shifts and to think about the problem, you think about the issue, you think of the, the scary thing that will happen after that, and that will box down in your mind. You creeps in and will restrict you from functioning. But the first thing, what the psalmist did was, he confesses what he knows about God. Verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? See, the first thing, instead of saying, God, I'm having this problem, no. The psalmist turned his perspective to God and recognized the attributes of God. 
Of course, in the Old Testament, you will find more and more attributes and as well in the New Testament. But here, just focus on three particularly. The first one is, the Lord is my light. Everyone say light. Light. You know, you have beautiful lights in this hall. Light. Light is a very important thing both in ancient time and also in modern era. Light in the Hebrew is or. Or. Okay, don't bother about what I just said. This, 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 my you know, professional sickness <laughs> because I teach Bible. <laughs> so, or in Hebrew, light. Now, in ancient time, when people walk, you don't have beautiful traffic light like today. You know? So, what they do is they carry a lamb to walk. And if you don't have light, you probably you hit something, a rock, and you fall down. And it's very dangerous, it's fearful. And that's why throughout the Old Testament and even the New Testament, the symbol of light always reminds us that there is someone here giving us a direction, a guidance. You know, when you are in darkness, don't worry because God is light. In the New Testament, you know this even better. John, the evangelist, says, Who is light? Jesus. Is the light. And Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. If you're walking in darkness, if you're walking in fear, the first thing you need to recognize is that God is the light of your life. In your darkness, in the darkest moment of your life, can you still see that God remains as the light of your life? You're going to shift your perspective from the evil, from the difficulties of your problem to God, who is the light. And that's the first attributes we see here. God is light. The second thing the psalmist describes about God is salvation. He is my salvation. In Hebrew, is Yesha. Yesha. That is where you get the name Yeshua. And that's where you get the, in, in the Greek name, Jesus, Yesu. So Jesus basically means God saves. He saves. And why we just sung the song, this name is so beautiful, is because it characterizes the nature of God. Our God is not a creator who creates us and dumb us aside. That is not the God that we worship in. The God that we worship is one who cares for us and when we are in a difficult problem, He will save us. That is the God that we believe. Don't believe that. If you don't believe that, look at Jesus. You know, God, we have just, you know, human have sinned, you, you have done so many bad things, but not of you. God can do that because that is fair because we have sinned against God. But yet, God chose to send His beloved Son, Jesus, Yeshua, to come to us, die on the cross, so that you and I will be saved. And so when you're walking in your darkest journey, when you're going through trouble, when your fear creeps into your heart, remind yourself that our God is a God who will save. He is not a God who, you know, just keep a distance from us, but He is God who saves us. He provides likes for us. He will save us. And not only that, psalmist describe Him as well as the stronghold. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In Hebrew, ma'oz, stronghold. He is the ma'oz, the stronghold of our life. What does stronghold mean? In ancient time, you know, they don't have those advanced military equipment like today. So what do they use? Can anyone guess what do ancient people use for war? I don't. I hear some. Um, yeah, I can guess. Very simple, you know. No, not difficult, not tricky question. Spear, right? Sword, bow and arrow, right? So, so yeah. Shields. Uh, those are very hands-on equipment. Right? You don't have bullets, you don't have machine guns, don't, don't have that kind of thing. So, in, if everything is equals, then it depends who have more soldiers. 
like in ancient time, who have more soldiers, then you see the chances are the, those with more soldiers will win. But not all wars are won by numbers. Okay, if you don't believe, go back and read your history books. You know, the Greeks particularly are very good in uh, fighting wars. Uh, that's why they are able to conquer so many lands by Alexander the Great. Now, besides having numbers, a very good strategy helps you to win a war. And in a very good, in a good strategy, always you take note of the geographical location. Okay? And usually, country, nations or kingdoms will like to uh, prepare their soldiers at what we call a high ground, a higher place. Why? Why? Because if you're at a higher ground, you can look down on your soldiers, on the enemies, and you can shoot arrows, you know, and they will have difficulties to reach you. You know, gravity tells you that. It's easier for those who are at the upper ground to win the war. And that's why if you go to, you know, in the West, in UK, I, I study in UK, you see many castles. Right? Castles are built tall and up high, right? And that's one reason, because you can put your archers there and shoot down the enemies or whatever it is. So that is a very important strategy. And that's how ancient people look at fortresses, stronghold. Uh, any higher ground they can, you know, they identify, they will try to make it a stronghold, a fortress. And within that stronghold, there you have peace. There you have protection. There you will not have fear as much as those who are down at the ground level. So I, I, I was privileged to visit some of these ancient sites uh, in the churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, the seven churches, uh, if you recall, in Revelation. And many of these cities are up in the mountain. You may wonder how ancient people can build that. I don't know, they don't have tractors, you know, those <laughs> modern equipment, but somehow they still prefer to go up to the mountain because they recognize the importance of a fortress, of a stronghold that will protect you, keep you safe. And the psalmist recognize that the Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is not just my light that will provide guidance that will give me direction in the darkness. He's not only my deliverer, my saviour, He's also my protector, my stronghold. When I'm in, prob in a problem, when I'm fearful, I have a place to hide. That is to hide in the Lord. There is a place where I can seek refuge. It's a place that I can find peace. The stronghold which is our Lord. And the psalmist goes on to explain and describe that in a house of the Lord, there is where you can proclaim and keep singing and keep dancing even though you are facing such difficult situation. You know, the psalmist, at the point of writing these psalms, he is facing such a da dangerous situation, a trouble that may cost his life. Yet, of all the things he recalls, he recalls his experience when he was worshipping God. The house of Lord. In verse 4, it says, One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Verse 5, For he will hide me in his shelter in a day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tents. He will lift me high upon a rock. And verse 6 says, And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Now, it's interesting. The psalmist recognizes the attributes of God and the experience that he recalls is his worship to God in the temple. Of course, in David's time, it's in not a full temple but a tent. That's why the word is used as a tent. And that's very important. As believers, as Christians, when we are going through our difficulties, every Sunday when you come back to your church to worship, this is the best time that you can 
confess the attributes of God, that will shift your mind back to God's goodness and His grace and what the Lord has done for you. And that's why you have a big book called Psalms in the Bible. You sing the Psalms. You dance and you worship God with songs and melody. And that will help you to turn your focus away from your problem and into God's goodness, God's attributes. So as we learn to recognize God's attributes in our life during our darkest moment, and it's not easy to do that, I know. I personally have went through a lot of issues. When I was just told to be the president, fear automatically creeped into my mind. How many of you here have been offered the role to be a president of Bible college before? I'm sure you have not, right? And this is a very unique kind of fear. The burden of the denomination lies on my shoulder and it's a very scary experience. But you know what? The best way to release this fear, the best way to overcome it, the first thing we do is to recognize God's attribute. Recognize that He is still the God who leads this school, not me. I'm only but a vessel. And how should I bring forth this proclamation? In singing, in worship. One thing you recognize the difference between me and my previous president is the way we worship. I think Pastor Koki, some of you may have known him, he worship in a kind of different style. Maybe he is not that fearful after all. <laughs> he has too much boldness in him. But for me, you know, being a young guy, a lot of things we are not certain. You know, people may not know me, and a lot of fears creep into me. But whenever I worship, I exalt the Lord with all my might, with all my heart. Why? One of the power that you get from that is that your fear is relief. Because your focus is no longer on your problem, but on God. So I encourage you, whenever you go through fear in life, as you recognize the attribute of God, do it as you sing. Sing aloud. Proclaim the name of God. Every time, every Sunday, we gather here, we sing. Don't just sit there and observe. It's not a show, by the way. It's a time where we exalt God. It is a time where we recall God's goodness in our life. As we sing the different description about God, it reassures us that our God is our light, our provider, our deliverer. He is the God who saved us. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. That is the God that we worship. Come on, give God a clap. Come on. I think, really, people... Do you know your God or not? And if you know your God, come on, whenever we worship God, do it with all your might. And that will help us to shift our focus from our problem to God. That is the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn here is that we also need to remain calm and confident. The first thing we learn is to recognize God's attributes. The second thing we learn is to remain calm and confident. Now, like I told you just now, even though as the psalmist recognized the attributes of God, he is not blind to the reality around him. You know, some, some people uh, make a comment about Christians because sometimes Christians, we always say, whenever you have a problem, don't worry, lah, don't worry, pray, pray, pray. No, okay, one, don't worry. And uh, I've heard a lot of non-believers say, you all Christians, huh? You just pretend only. You know, you just pretend everything is okay. You know, but the reality is not the same, you know. That's what they will say, isn't it? Have you heard that kind of comment before? You're Christians, uh, you just turn a blind eye. Lah. Right. Especially in those days, uh, uh, even now, we have a lot of uh, uh, march going on in the public and, uh, and people say, oh, how will Christians respond? Uh, many of Christians just turn a blind eye. You don't realize what is going on in the reality and you just sing and enjoy yourself in a church. Many people say that. And, and the psalmist tells us, no, that's not the case. We Christians, we know exactly what is going on. It's not that we turn a blind eye. In verse 2, verse 2 says, When evil doer assails me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Verse 3 says, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. 
And if we know that this psalmist is David himself, we know he experienced a lot of trouble. There were people trying to hunt him down because of his intellectual capability, because he's smart, because the favor of the Lord is him, is on him. There are people with the previous dynasty want to kill him off. It's a real threat. He's almost, he almost died. And there are soldiers camped against him. Anyone here fought a real war before? Uh, I hope not. Anyone here uh, was alive then during the Japanese occupation? No? Yeah, we have someone. My grandparents, they were there. And they tell me stories during the Jap Japanese occupation. Any, any Japanese here? No, huh? <laughs> Sorry, nah, this is a history, the video like it or not, okay? Um, and it was so scary. They have to hide at the roof. You know, they, it was so scary. It's a real danger. They almost lost their life. They have witnessed people being slaughtered. And it's a very scary experience. So Christians, we are not trying to just turn a blind eye. The psalmist knows exactly what is going on. He knows how dangerous is that. Yet, yet, the psalmist says, I have confidence in God. You either allow fears to rule over you or you allow your faith to rule over you. And the psalmist choose the latter. As the psalmist recognized God's attribute, not only that he knows about God, he has confidence in God, who is that caring God, who is that God who will lead and will guide and will protect him. Verse 10 says, For my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. You see how he recognized his confidence in God? Even, even though if his parents forsake him, yet God, who is my real parent, my spiritual parents, will never forsake me. That is the kind of confidence that he has in God. Verse 13 to 14 says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So the psalmist says, yes, the reality is real, it's dangerous, it's scary, but I choose not to allow this to interfere into my heart. I choose to remain calm and have confidence in God. Remain calm. Recently, I've seen a lot of t-shirts have this big word, keep calm. Anyone seen those t-shirts? You know? Keep calm. I don't know where it comes from, you know. How, how many of you know where exactly this thing comes from? Keep calm. But I, I think I like that because... It's true, when you are in a situation like that, keep calm. Recognize that God is the one who will deliver you. Remain calm and wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Because this is what Jesus tells us as well. Seek after the Lord. Keep your confidence in God. Cast your worries to Him. So what can we do? What can we do? You say, Pastor, Pastor, uh, yes, yes, I know, we need to remain calm, but I'm so scared now. You know, I have a lot of issues. I don't know what to do. A few things you can do here. Uh, first of all, learn to wait. Learn to wait. Wait. Kava, wait. In Hebrew, waiting is not just doing nothing. Sometimes, uh, some, some, I have a member of my church says, Pastor, what do you mean by waiting upon the Lord? Is it just do nothing, just sit there and, uh, and things will happen by itself? No, 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 no. That's not the kind of wait that we're talking about. That is not waiting. That is idleness. <laughs> right? Idleness and Timothy says, don't feed them at all because that's laziness. Waiting, kava in Hebrew, in the sense that you look forward for something to happen. But you can't do anything now. So you wait with certain expectation in you. Andrew Murray, a very famous uh, author, said this, Be assured that if God waits longer than you could wish, it is only to make the blessing doubly precious. 
God waited 4,000 years till the fullness of time ere He sent His Son. Our times are in His hand. He will avenge His elect speedily. He will make haste for our help and not delay one hour too long. And so Murray encouraged us, learn to wait because God never late. It's just that you are trying to rush things off on your own timing. God's timing is the best. And sometimes God wants us to learn to wait. While we are waiting, you will learn to put your trust in God. I guess that's why sometimes God does not answer our prayer immediately. And it's a journey of faith that we need to learn. As we go through darkness of time, that is the time where you are being pushed and tested. How far do you trust God with this? How far do you trust God with this issue? How long do you will, are you willing to wait? And in our busy urban Christians, we want to solve things immediately. In a world that is so fast, we want things to be solved almost instantaneously. But that is not the way with the Lord. The Lord wants us to learn to wait. Wait in His presence. Wait with expectation. And that is where God will then encourage us and give us words and let us experience His goodness as He leads us through the situation. And the second thing that you can do in trying to keep yourself calm, that is to encourage yourself in the Lord. David do this, does this quite often in his life. Whenever he was, you know, feel very down and negative and quite sad and passive, he will go to a place of solitary and there is where he will encourage himself. Let the Word of God speak to, his, speak to himself. Let the Word of God ring in his ears. Many Christians today, somehow, I don't know why, maybe because we are so used to um, listen to sermons and expect other people to feed us, we don't know how to feed ourselves. Now, just now, your, your, your church leaders make a very important presentation about your school of ministry. Many Christians today need to learn how to grow up. Everyone say grow up. You know, I have just recently become a father not too long ago. My son is one and a half years, okay? And I, I truly understand now how difficult it is to be a father. You know, I, I read about it in the past, but now I know it's very difficult. You, know, you need to take care of the child, uh, and you're you know, always so scared of the child to take care. You know, maybe the child is not breathing well, you know, sleeping posture, la, this, la, pampers, la, food, la, everything, you know. Oh, yo, I didn't realize it until now. Oh, so many things to take care of. You know, midnight also we'll wake up and this kind of thing. And I realize many Christians are like that. Anything pastor, call pastor. No. Not happy. Pastor, help me. Everything pastor, pastor. No wonder pastor all oh, uh, high blood pressure already. How to handle? One person handle 200 old people. But you read in the New Testament what Paul says, every one of us, we are all saved by the same grace. And all of us are given that revelation of truth. And another book in the New Testament, Hebrew says, we are all priesthood. Not just your pastor, your priesthood. All of us are priesthood. And so we need to learn to grow up. Every time you face difficult situation, you need to learn how to keep calm. How do you need to keep calm? Learn to wait. Not only waiting, you have to learn how to encourage yourself with the Word of God. So don't just wait for pastor to cook something for you to eat. Learn to cook something on your own. What I mean by cooking is that read the Word on your own. Let the Word instill faith in you. Let the word quickens your heart, shift your eyes so that you will no longer be fearful. How I wish pastor will always walk beside me every day 24-7. How I wish, but that is not a reality. But if you read your Bible carefully 
especially John's Gospel, you have one who walks beside you every day. And that is the Holy Spirit. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to bring you to remember the Word. And so you need to learn how to encourage yourself with the Word of God. It's just as how the psalmist did. Don't wait for anyone else. You sing the psalm, you recite the Word, you recall God's goodness, and you encourage yourself. And when you can do that, your heart will be still. So not only you just wait, you encourage yourself in God, and you surrender the situation to God. As you learn to release this situation to God, you find that this problem is not that big after all. That's a very, that's a very good prayer um, that describes this whole surrendering thing. Now let me just read to you. It says this, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And let me read it once again. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. When you learn to release the problem that you cannot do anything about to God, it helps you to keep calm and to release all this situation to God because you know ultimately God will take care of it. So, we have learned two things. First is to recognize God's attributes. Second is to remain calm and confident in God. And the final thing that you can do when you face a situation, difficult situation, fearful situation, what can you do? You can request, make a plea to God in an honest prayer. Request with an honest prayer. Verse 7 onwards, you can see that in the psalm, there is a change of tone. Earlier on, you see the psalmist kind of like very confident, right? But verse 7 onwards, you see the psalmist seems to be more and more desperate. And he says, verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Hear, O Lord, very desperate. Come on, Lord, hear me, answer me. And then in verse 8 and 9, you see that even, even more, you know, very, seems like he's very insecure. He says, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O Lord, you who have been my help, cast me not, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Now, some of you, when you read this, you say, Hey, Pastor, I thought just now you say you must have confidence in God, ma. must keep calm. Ma. How come the psalmist now like, gila already? Ah. Why he turn one? Why he change one? Now, if you have really gone through real fear in life, you will know what he's going through now. There will be moments in your life you come up stronger. But then, you find that it will go through a cycle. You go back down and it will, you know the fear will creep in again. To fight fear, it's no joke, you know. It's not that one time off, we can, you know, oh, I'm victorious, bye-bye, I will always be victorious. No, that's not the case. Those who face real fear in life, you know what I'm talking about. It's a journey that you go up and down, up and down. There will be time that you go back in fear. You become insecure, you become doubtful. You know, is it going to be right there? Is it all right? God, is it just pray like that? Is this just trust you? Is that all? There will be times that you go back down and you start asking questions, doubts will come and creeps in once again. Even the disciples of Jesus, they also went through the same thing. No matter what Jesus told them for the last three years, on the cross, they all fled. They all went off. Chabut. Because of fear. And it's true. But the psalmist tell us a very important fact here. Even when you are doubtful of God, even when you're not sure if this is going to work things out, you pray to God honestly. You see, the psalmist never just pray the beautiful, beautiful prayer. Oh God, no matter what it is, you're always the sovereign God, the sovereign Lord. But what about the insecurity in you? What are doubts in you? Bring it to God. 
you don't have to always pray the nice, nice prayer. When you are fearful, when you are doubtful, when you don't know what is next, bring it to God. Release your frustration to God. Release your anger to God. Release your insecurity to God, your doubt to God. God can handle it. Don't worry. You know, I, I have been a pastor for some time. Some of my members, you know, I don't know whether they try to impress me or what. So they come up with very beautiful prayer, you know. Uh, I think they copy somewhere. Lah. Uh, very beautiful when they pray, uh, oh Lord of heaven, you know, no, 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 no. And after the whole thing, I ask them, so how do you feel? Well, <laughs> I still feel like that, Lord. Of course, because you're not honest with God. You just say the nice, nice prayer. Maybe for the sake of those who are listening. But when you're going through serious trouble, forget about all these nice, nice words. Bring your real emotion into your prayer. God can handle it. If you're frustrated with God, bring it to God. God knows. God knows what you're going through now. That is why many Christians, they find re Christianity become more like a religion. Just to say, do the prayer, do the thing, and then move on. That is not real Christianity that you're experiencing. You are just going through the motion. If you really want to experience God in the Word, in your life, bring your honest situation to God. Request to God. Ask God for help. Cry out to Him. You know, in our church, we had the same situation. We have a situation a few years back and the church almost in a very dire situation. You know the way we pray? You know how we pray? We don't use many words. Something so simple as in, God, save us! That's it. Very simple prayer. But that is that all we can say. And there's one, one time, we have a church board members. Um, a, a child passed away, you know, uh, while, while giving birth. What can you say? What kind of prayer you will pray? And in those times, we just release our anger to God. God, how can you do this? This is not fair. But God can take in. God once you start be open to God, and that's where God begins to go into your heart and do the changes and shape you and give you the serenity, the peace that will keep you calm, that will overcome your fear. So, don't, don't just pray the usual prayer when you're going through a situation. Come to God honestly. Pray. An honest prayer, just like how Jesus did at Gethsemane. Pray until blood sweat. That is how honest Jesus was at that time. So you and I, when we have a situation in life, we can learn these three things. First is to, what? Recognize God. Recognize who is God. Recognize His attributes. What He can do for you. And the second thing, we remain calm and confident in God. Don't worry. Learn to wait upon Him. Keep calm. And thirdly, we can request with an honest prayer. Come before God honestly and let God deal with it. Deal with your emotion so that you can come out strong and overcome your fear in life. Now I'm going to end this sermon with a simple illustration. I need, just need the help of uh, the guy to just help me turn off the light for a while. I hope none of you here are fear of dark. Huh? Okay, just turn off the light for a while. Just imagine that in your life, this is the darkness that you are facing. And a lot of times we face darkness, we don't see any direction. And all of a sudden, you see a light beam. Something like that. 
Many people, when they, when they go through difficulties in life, fear in life, they know there is a beam of light, but that light is just too small in contrast with the darkness surrounding this room. Most people will say, we'll focus on the darkness and say, "How? come on, how can this small beam of light help? What can this do? And they continue to allow fear to creep into their hearts and take over them. But let me encourage you today as believers that you don't just look at the beam of light, but you look at the source of this beam of light that will eventually brighten this whole room. The light will grow bigger and bigger by days because you're not just looking at the light itself, but the source of it. And one day, you will realize that this room is no longer that dark anymore because you recognize who is behind that light. And can I have the staff to just turn back on the light, please? In life, there are many things that we cannot predict. There are many things that we don't know. And all these fears creep into our hearts. But, this, but don't just look at the surrounding darkness. As you see that small beams of light in your life, remember that the source of that beam of light is God. And He is able to shine the darkness in your life. I encourage all of us just to stand on our feet. At this moment, I just want to pray. Let's pray together. No matter what you're facing through this year, let me tell you, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still the same God who is the light, who is the one who will save us, who is the one who is our strongholds, our ma'oz. So come to Him and just let God fill your heart with confidence, with peace, and that you'll be able to come out victoriously. And this year will mark a new year of your journey with God. And at the end of the day, you can testify, God, you are such a true and wonderful God. Let's just spend some time praying. Come on, church. Let's just spend some time praying. And just let God's, the light of God shine deeply in your heart. If you have fear in your heart now, just commit it to God. Be honest with God. Share your fear to Him. Express your insecurity, the doubt that in your heart. Just bring it to God. Come on, church. Just bring it to God. Pray now. Oh Lord, in you we have liberty, oh God. Oh, let fear be removed now, Lord. Oh, let faith arise now, oh God. Let me be able to be still in you, Lord. Then when we move out from this place, we have confidence in you, O God. Come on, express it. Express it to God with confidence in God. Knowing that God is the one who will save you, who will provide for you, who will protect you. Come on, church. Bring it to God. Bring your voice to God. Confess that He is the victory. He is the light of your life. You recognize your God. Come on, people, recognize God, what He has done for you, and what He will do for you. Continue to praise Him and bring your issue to Him now. Just be honest with Him. I just want to invite the worship team to just lead a song that will help us to declare with faith. And this year, the new year, we will have victory. We will overcome fear of our life. And we know that our God is in front of us. He is the light that will shine us and will lead us through. And He is our God who will save us and our stronghold. And so let us just focus on God and declare Him. And, he, and just worship Him with all our might and all our hearts and cast all fears away in Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing, let's worship Him. Hallelujah.
Yes, it's all about you. God, I pray, O oh Lord, that as we come to this brand new year, it is a year that we'll experience your power, your grace in our life. God, we proclaim that you rule over our life. We will not allow fear to rule us, O oh God. Lord, as this church is moving into a new journey, as they are embarking into their new building, I pray, O oh God, that you will increase their faith. Increase their faith, O oh Lord, that they will have confidence in you, that they will remain calm when situation does not seem to be all right, because they know that God is behind them, that God is in this house, that God is the light and the shelter for them. I pray, O oh God, that you will move them, O oh Lord, to walk in this journey of faith, not by might, not by sight, but by faith in God. And Lord, when they are going through circumstances and they have difficulties, Lord, I pray that you will hear their prayer from heaven, that you will open up heavens to them, that you will hear every prayer that they request, that they bring before you, because you are the God who hear prayers. You are the God who comforts. You are the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you want us to come before you with that honest prayer every day, every single moment. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you. You are such a good God to us. And we offer ourselves entirely to you, not to be shaken again, but totally trusting in your way, moving into a brand new year. We thank you, Lord. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. Come on and give God a blessing. Praise the Lord.